Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us at the third event of the carnival season. It's been a really interesting series so far, kicking off in May with the Force Majeure panel discussion, followed by the new architecture writers in July. Today's event is entitled African Space Magicians. It's an open-ended, frank, and hopefully passionate discussion between seven outstanding African architects and a child, part of a younger generation of hyphenated architects, architect educators, architect filmmakers, architect activists, architect entrepreneurs, architect builders, who are shaping the way we think about and practice architecture, not only on the African continent and diaspora. They are an integral part of the laboratory of the future, practitioners who embody everything the exhibition hope it represents. A new school for a new century, a new pedagogy for a new age, and a new understanding of architecture for a new and very, very different world. The Zulu term for an architect, umkambi wesino, is a beautifully complex phrase, meaning alternatively, a magician of space, the maker of a situation, or the maker of a sensation. I can't think of many languages in which the term architect is so accurately translated. Yes, we make spaces, but we also make situations, and people experience sensations in the spaces we design. The phrase captures the tension that is always present between the idea of something, which the architect is nominally in charge of, and its material reality, which is the user's domain, by reimagining the architect as a magician maker, able to move fluidly between different states. So it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce these seven magicians or panelists, starting on my left with Papa Omotayo, a Lagos-based architect, urbanist, and researcher whose practice focuses on collaboration and material exploration as a pathway towards sustainable growth and social impact, especially on the African continent. I asked each of the panelists to tell me something about themselves that other people might not know. Not all of them did, but Papa did, and his master's thesis was based on the instrumentals of a hip-hop song that he and his flatmate came up with. Next to him is Selassie Setufe, MBE. Currently, she currently works for B First Generation in London. As a senior architect and innovative sites manager, she champions high quality design across a variety of projects, ranging from large scale master plans to facilitating innovative solutions on small sites. And her interesting fact is that she has a twin cousin, am I right? Yes. So she and her cousin were born on the same day, in the same year, in two different locations, Britain and Ghana. Together with Ama Ofori Daku, Aqua Danso and Nebaseri, she founded Black Females in Architecture, a global membership network and enterprise founded to increase the visibility of Black and Black mixed heritage women within the architectural industry and other built environment fields. She was awarded an MBE for her services to diversity in architecture in Queen Elizabeth's 2022 New Year's Honours List. Nzinga Mboup is a Dakar-based Senegalese architect. She trained in South Africa and the UK, and in 2019, she co-founded Warofila, an architectural practice specializing in bioclimatic design and construction using earth and biomaterials sourced locally. And her fact is that in order to preserve what she and her brother thought was the staple food of monkeys, at the age of five and seven respectively, they decided to stop eating bananas. She still doesn't eat them today. Amal Foridako is a part two graduate from Cambridge University, where she began her ongoing research exploring churches within London's African and Caribbean communities. She joined Black Females in Architecture in 2022, and her unusual fact, if, I'm right, if I remember correctly, is that she sings in the shower <laughs> to Fela Kute's Water No Day. <laughs> 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 
Sharif Tal is a filmmaker, director, screenwriter, and photographer, and soon to be actor, also actor from Senegal. In this year's exhibition, he worked with Nzinga and Boop to give us an intimate insight into the Senegalese engineer Dodu Deme's context, projects, and vision to achieve low carbon and more humane built environments. Sadly, he didn't give me an unusual fact. <laughs> Aziza Shaouni is the principal of Aziza Shaouni Projects, a multidisciplinary team of architects, urban planners, landscape architects, engineers, and visual artists. They are based in Toronto, Canada, and Fez. And two minutes ago, she gave me her facts, which I'm gonna pull up. <laughs> she can stop her sense of smell to allow her to work on a sewage rerouting project, which was her first project in Morocco, which won the gold medal from Holcim, the Fez River Rehabilitation. And last, but by no means least, Nebaseri is a spatial practitioner and lecturer at the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL, as well as Sheffield School of Architecture. She's a graduate of Aachen University in Central St. Martins, and she was previously a senior project officer at the Greater London Authorities Regeneration Team. And her research and interests look at how citizen-led initiatives can have long-term impact on the spaces we inhabit, particularly involving young communities in the regeneration proce um, process through advocacy and research. And she does have an unusual fact, but I forgot to, to ask her for it, so I'm gonna do that in the conversation. So welcome, everybody. It's a real pleasure to have you here. And I'm going to kick off the discussion with a few questions directed specifically to each of you, questions that I've always wanted to ask you. So I'm gonna start with you, Papa, but I'm not gonna go in um, sort of alphabetical or sequential order. You live and work in Lagos in one of the world's fastest urbanizing corridors, a mega conglomeration that's predicted to be the most densely urbanized zone on the planet in the next 30 years. Did your education as an architect prepare you in any way to think about what this means? Uh, hi, good afternoon everybody. It's lovely to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting us, Leslie, and uh, it's great to be with everybody on this panel. Uh, it's, it's interesting that you asked that question because I think throughout my architectural education, which was predominantly in the UK for the latter part of my life, I was always conscious that I was going back to Lagos and, and it's an overwhelming city with huge, huge challenges. I think what the architectural profession did was to establish um, an understanding about a process, uh, an investigation, but what it didn't do is give me an understanding of how to engage in that process. You know, I, I think Lagos especially is a space of negotiation and there's huge amounts of negotiations that have, have to happen to order to, um, to do any type of intervention. Um, you're constantly being asked and challenged at every space, um, at every proposal. And as much as the architectural education allows you to look at cities, um, and, and objects from a very plan and three-dimensional view. What it lacks, um, and I think what the opportunity and what a lot of, you know, the way architecture has been stretched, especially by practitioners on the continent, is this more um, visceral engagement uh, with space on a very human level. Uh, and I think that's, that's the thing that I was unprepared for, the, the, the level of negotiation that is constant and unrelenting. It's interesting, I mean, if you think about the tools that you're given in school, usually, you know, representation tools, historical tools, um, analytical tools, maybe technical tools, but the idea of the ability to negotiate as being a really important component of the process, I think is something we should just keep in, in the back of our heads. So negotiation is a really great one. And Nzinga, I'm going to come to you. In the Guardian newspaper recently, the Nigerian novelist Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie discusses being at the intersection of race and gender, the double whammy, as some people have called it. She writes about be at the joy of being several things at once, about the pleasure of containing multitudes. Does the word multitude resonate with you, particularly in the way you practice? 
Absolutely. Um, I think uh, the multitude starts with uh, my very being because uh, I have, uh, and I think we, we, we all share this here, um, a very layered identity, which um, as you grow up can be something that can uh, serve as a ground for people to shun you, but uh, getting to the point uh, when you realize that it is something that uh, gives you fortitude um, has uh, now helped me a lot in navigating um, my, my condition as, a, as an African architect, as a Senegalese architect, but with very multiple other origins and, uh, and an education in the UK, in South Africa, and just uh, um, life lived across the continent. Um, and uh, in the role as well that, we, um, that I, I play as an architect, um, it, is, it is many things all at once. Um, you have to be a practitioner, you have to be a mediator, you have to be just a general hustler, we spoke about it, um, and uh, you do so in a context in which very many people are surprised to see a woman in the construction industry because that's how architecture is framed, and uh, especially when it's a young woman, and uh, you often have to um, sort of call on to other sets of skills to make yourself understood because, um, for instance, when you go to site and uh, there's, a, there's a problem, I've seen many, um, you know, male counterparts feel like shouting is going to resolve it. Obviously, if I shout on site, I lose all credibility. So you have learned, and this is also something that's come from, from the education, to really be able to tap onto other um, strengths of the ways of uh, persuading people. We were talking about negotiation, but there's also pers persuasion, communication, and asserting authorities through different ways. So it's, yeah, there's um, a, a sort of uh, um, very different tool sets at my disposal to be able to navigate the world, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite grateful for that. Yeah. And just to pick up on that, so you spoke about having layered identities, you know, an identity that's in many layers, and I think that's common to everybody on the panel. And that layering, you feel, gives you additional tools? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, I was, uh, <laughs> I was uh, given uh, advice um, by my mentor, who's also the father of uh, Sherif Tal, when I moved to Senegal, um, and he told me, because so the Senegal is the country of my father, I did not grow up in Senegal. I've been living there for the past six years, so I, although I, had a, I have a cultural attachment to the country, I think uh, moving there, especially as an adult and architect, uh, was, uh, was a brand new experience, um, which, uh, a brand new challenge that I had to navigate. And the advice that he told me is that, um, what you do with your different identities is that you kind of look at it as a chest of drawers that you can open mm -hmm. depending on the situation and whatever suits you best. Mm -hmm. Whenever you want to fully engage with all the cultures and the traditions in the way that kind of serves you, you do that or in ways in which it allows you to connect with people. Mm -hmm. If it becomes a hindrance, you can also shy away from that, is that you have the ability to essentially not yeah, pick and choose, but harness different um, parts of yourself depending on the situation and what really mm. serves you. Mm. So now I do see it as a, as a strength because for the many time, especially when you let other people define you um, and you try to get into this um, dynamic of responding to that or having to prove yourself, you really give out a lot of energy mm -hmm. and uh, being very self-assured in, in who you are with all the different parts of your beings I think, yeah, just, just gives you a lot more mm -hmm. skills and, and tool set and language as well. Mm -hmm. Language is also a really big thing. It's about also learning how to speak very different languages. It is not just about being able to speak French, English, or Wolof. It's also being able to know who is it that you're talking to, uh, what is their background, where are they coming from, and adjusting to that. Mm -hmm. And that, with my experience, I feel like it's one of the greatest skill set that I have. Being able to speak to a mason or speak to a representative of the state doesn't um, mm -hmm. utilize the same language um, set. So you have to be a, I don't know if you should say a chameleon, but mm -hmm. have yeah, ways in which you can adapt to very different situations all at once, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just from those two answers, there's a, um, a mental image that's very strong for me of 
a shapeshifter, like a, a chameleon, the ability to be many things in many different contexts. So, you know, in a certain way, this panel contains its own multitudes from tenured professors to collectives to from filmmakers. And at one level, we could argue that the thing that connects everyone is Africa. But at another deeper level, I would say that it's your approach to architecture that really connects you. You have a vision or a version of architecture that continuously expands to meet its context. Aziza, would you say that being African is less about provenance, where you come from or where you work, and more about attitude? That's a different, a, a very difficult question. <laughs> um, I think that a part of the attitude that you have is um, conditioned by your you know, upbringing. Uh, um, and I think, um, you know, Africa has such a diverse, mm -hmm. you know, like set of different cultures and, you know, like approaches also to education and so forth. But I think there is something that, you know, it ties together is that we are, um, we have very strong, you know, community ties and very strong, you know, family ties. Uh, we can work in adversity very, you know, you know, efficiently. So I think this type of, you know, of attitude, one, you know, in French you would say débrouillard, you know, like where you would uh, do with whatever you have and, you know, achieve whatever you need to achieve with the means that you have. Uh, resourcefulness, you know, like I would say, um, is maybe what can define us, you know, in some way. But I have to add, you know, like one more thing. I think it's our, I don't know how to even define it, but our connection uh, to our land, you know, in a certain way. And um, our wish to be agent mm -hmm. in, you know, of change mm -hmm. in our own, you know, of environments, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if I answered your uh, question. No, it does. I mean, I remember reading a long time ago, I think it was Chinua Achebe, who says, you know, if I'm walking down the street in New York and someone says, hey, you're African, he didn't completely understand what it meant, but he knew that it was significant. And it took him a large part of his writing life to be able to articulate what that meant. Also partly because when you're in Africa, you don't have the same sense of being African, you are just where you are. Yeah. So I'm just curious as to what are the components that make one feel African? I think it's after you leave you you actually take a distance. I mean, I realized I was, you know, African, uh, you know, um, when I went to study at Columbia University and I shared this, you know, anecdote, you know, yesterday is that if it was my first time in America, I said my foot on campus and, you know, obviously where would I go? I looked at the African club, you know, there was one, you know, I didn't read African American, I just saw African and I head there. And, you know, I was not welcomed, actually. Uh, and then it was the first time that I realized, that, am I really African? Yes, I am. You know, my mom is from Senegal, my dad is from Morocco, where am I from? But yet in North America, I was not considered an African. And actually it was the first time, my first week in America, where I started to question how I perceived my identity was not how I was perceived in North America. Mm -hmm. But definitely is when I left that I realized. But I still wanted to add one thing regarding North Africa versus, you know, of Africa. And I think that this is a divide that I also realized, you know, after I left. I mean, the Moroccan diaspora is, you know, everywhere in West Africa and the rest of Africa. We really considered ourselves, you know, as Africans. Uh, but, um, like I would say that the Moroccan state disengage a bit, mm -hmm. you know, and, and wants to cast us more as uh, Arabs, as part of the MENA uh, region. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, um, in a way, one of my goals, what I'm hoping is that this newer generation or to try to raise awareness about the fact that we are connected to this continent, we are part, you know, of this continent. And this divide between North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa should not exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think we have to raise it. I mean, North Africa, what does North Africa, what is its role versus the rest of Africa? Are we one? What are you know, our connections? And when we start to look at it, I mean, we have very deep, and I have more in common with you know, other, let's say, you know, Africans than with Europeans, you know, like for example. And yet, Morocco, the Moroccan state, uh, 
leads this uh, propaganda, you know, like to cast Morocco as a Middle Eastern country. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it, we talked a little bit about multitudes, but it's kind of interesting that one can be from the continent, define oneself as African, but also as Arab, define oneself as part of the global south, define oneself as part of the developing world, as part of the diaspora. So there are many, many, again, layers to the, to the identity that's at the macro level as well as the, the individual. So Selassie, Neba, and Amma, black females in architecture were set up to address the lack of support, visibility, and agency of black women in architecture in the UK who make up less than 1% of the architecture profession. Now that the organization is thriving, what would you say has been its greatest achievement, but also its greatest challenge? Um, I guess, so my positionality in the organization, I was a member before I was a part of the actual team. And I think conversations about architecture, we often um, try and define what architecture really is, and I think Western understandings of that are very tangible and concrete and material. And I think BFA, at least my understanding of it, um, our architecture or our legacy or our output, and what I would read to be our greatest achievement is the impact that we have in the lives of the members and the people that engage with us, because I think when I first, the first event I went to, I think I left there feeling extremely nourished. That was the word that I would use. And they kind of pulled me back from the edge of questioning whether this was a profession that I wanted to stay in at all. And I think that as much as that's not a material output, I think it's extremely mm -hmm. um, tangible. And I mean, my presence here is a testament to Mm -hmm. what BFA has done in my personal life. So I would say that was our greatest achievement. And I guess the other side of the coin, a challenge is um, kind of defining that in the architectural sphere, which is, as I've already said, super. Um, we like a concrete definition, but our output is extremely fluid and intangible and kind of communicating that is a challenge, I find, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Founders. <laughs> um, yeah, I think definitely the, the greatest achievement is probably better s spoken about from um, people in our membership. I think for founders, I'll speak for myself, but I know what we share in common as a great achievement is just existing as a community and being a sort of place of support for each other, um, yeah, I think that for me is our greatest achievement. Um, a challenge is um, exploring how we can grow and build a legacy through this um, platform that we're creating and I guess do more of what we've started and um, expand that beyond starting in London. We have a global membership and we really do wanna support people in a, in, in a bigger way across the entire um, world where we have members all over and we haven't yet sort of cracked mm -hmm. how we do that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a great challenge, which I hope in the sort of soon we'll be able to garner the support to be mm -hmm. able to do that. And I was gonna say, Neba, before you answer, I need to know your facts. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so when I was in primary school, on my way to primary school, I would see, um, a little mouse on the way. And I convinced myself that it was speaking to me and I was seeing it every day. And then later, my aunt told me that the sign of my tribe is actually a mouse, so, I, yeah. You saw your people. Yeah, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> so back to the question about the black females. Um, I think our greatest achievement is to be here, actually. Um, it's still with a lot of gratitude and, and amazement that we are around a table like this to discuss with inspiring people. So starting this global conversation around why BFA needs to exist and more mm -hmm. spaces than where we started from um, seems to be, um, for me, a very big achievement. Um, and I, I agree, how, the challenge is how do we do that and what is our next step to become even more um, global? Mm -hmm. I mean, 
it's something I've spoken about before that the particular burden for, you know, students, I'm speaking about students of architecture, not really practitioners yet, but the biggest burden is having to try to explain and explore an idea at the same time. Actually, in order to move forward, you, you often need distance from justifying, explaining, summarizing, theorizing what you're doing. You need, you need space. And actually, for many architects of color, that space doesn't exist because you're having to explain and justify your existence all the time. So there's some tension between, I guess, explanation and exploration that I think is really important. And you sort of speak about making the road as you walk it, which can, on the one hand, be incredibly exhilarating, but it can also be exhausting. Um, so I think that there's something in the amount of labor it takes just to exist that's not often, often spoken about. Yeah. Okay, so last question to Sherif. The conventional language of architecture or architectural representation has always been plans, sections, and elevations. But increasingly, we're finding that although these may be useful tools for instructing someone how to build, they're not always useful as tools of the imagination. In other words, there are other forms of representation that lend themselves better to explorations of things that certainly in Africa and the diaspora have been considered outside of architecture, emotion, community, the relationship between the human and non-human worlds, resilience, and so on. And these things are very difficult to capture in architecture's conventional language. So as a filmmaker who is passionately interested in architecture, how do you understand the relationship of film to the built environment? What can film tell us that a building cannot? Well, one thing that film allows, it does allow you to navigate the space uh, very visually. Um, not only you navigate a space, but you also navigate the emotions that, that come with the space. So I think beyond photography, beyond any other art form, I think film is really that one medium that has all the tools to give you the broadest spectrum mm -hmm. of what is architecture. And I mean, I know you come from an architect, a very famous architect father. This is a slightly different question, did that make you resist the temptation to become an architect? Was there ever a temptation? Um, not really. Uh, like I told you yesterday, I think I always wanted to make a, a to create an identity as an artist for myself, and I didn't want to be in the continuity of his legacy. Mm -hmm. And um, to be honest, I never thought I would end up in architecture photography or architecture film, but. It is something that I inherited from uh, all these conversations that I had with him throughout the years, from uh, formal or non-formal discussions, and uh, from my relationship with uh, Zynga. And I now realize that, although I did try to resist it, I am fully immersed yeah. in it. It has a way of just pulling you back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's also interesting. When I studied architecture, which is you know, 30, 35 years ago, the number of people in my my year at the Bartlett, whose parents, or one of their parents was an architect, was incredibly high. But for people of color, that was probably never the case. So I kept thinking that I had landed in, a, in an environment where people knew what architecture was because they'd seen their mothers or their fathers or their grandfathers. There was actually somebody who both sets of grandparents on both sides, both parents and two brothers were architects. <laughs> And so to be in the room with someone like that was incredibly intimidating because I thought that there was a language that I knew nothing about. And it's kind of, I don't know what the word is exactly, um, heartening to find after 30 years actually that conversation is coming around such that this layered identities that we all speak about is now recognized as a, as a strength in architecture rather than having generations who'd practiced it before. So I'm going to stop the slideshow and show um, the first film, which is um, Sharif and Nzinga's film, Bunt Ban. So if we can dim the lights, that would be great. I think one of the, the things that's, well, many, many things that really um, struck me about the film, 
But one is that there's an incredible emphasis in the filmmaking on materials and the processes of a construction. So the mason and the architect and the site manager appear somehow as accessories to, to the film. They're not the center of it, which is the complete inverse of the way we normally think about the architect hero figure as the person who is kind of controlling and orchestrating everything. And the second thing is in the, in the line at the end where you say that thinking about the construction material forces us to question everything. And I love this idea that, that building in a different way is not only about building the bricks and mortar, it's actually about building life, it's about building economies, about building community, about building resilience. Can you just say a little bit about that decision to focus so much on the material and, and why you decided to put out the provocation that material can change everything? I'm gonna answer the first part of the question and Zinga is gonna answer the second one. Um, I wanted to approach, well, it's an experimental film, so I had to step outside my comfort zone and I really wanted to approach the materials as a character mm -hmm. of their own, right? Um, the whole process of making the bricks, the whole art brief, um, is very performative. So my first edit involved a lot of music. Right? I wanted, um, I wanted the, the materials to be in motion. Right? Mm -hmm. And Zinga decided that we, that, and she did point out that we don't need the music, that the materials, the process itself, even the sound, speaks volume. Right. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So on the on the second question, it is um, it is a very important thing um, that Dudu said. So the the movie is uh, entirely narrated by by Dudu Dem, uh, who's a, a, a collaborator of mine, and. Uh, when he says that it is a way, building an earth is a way to question everything, it really starts with, um, at the very inception, how you even um, recognize the material that you're building with. Not all earth um, is good for construction. And uh, very surprisingly, you actually sometimes have to involve your own body mm -hmm. with the matter to see whether it's adequate for construction. So it shifts entirely um, the ways in which the relationship that we have with the construction materials as architects for sure, for the builders, but even the occupants of the house. Um, in Senegal, this is an ancestral um, technique, knowledge, it's really nothing that is new. Um, it's a skill that has been lost um, and there's just been further disconnection between I think the people that make the buildings and occupy them and the processes. And with Earth, there's an opportunity to, to sort of like link mm -hmm. those two again because the material is there, it is low tech. It requires, regardless of what people we see in the factory, there's other techniques that require very little tools. Um, and uh, these buildings that are made with Earth are much more suited to the climate, but they also re require the inhabitant to exist in the space differently. Um, it has to work with natural ventilation, uh, for instance, so people have to remember that they have to open their windows. People have to pay attention after a few cycles of rain about replastering their building. Like, it's a, it's a very living material. Mm -hmm. It's not something that is just there, that it's fixed, it's not a product. And then the last part is all the people, which is very um, strongly highlighted in this uh, movie, is that you have a whole ecosystem of people that actually build these things, which um, in, these one, in this case, the people are trained, and I'm really glad that we also gave um, uh, a voice to the mason. So the person that was speaking in Wolof is actually one of the masons, who, who now is an advocate for earth construction, but the first building that he worked on was the Jolof Hotel, and he didn't know anything about it, and he was just charged with all these uh, preconception that earth is, it doesn't work, it's not durable, um, it's just never going to hold. And this is a four-star hotel in the middle of Dakar, and, uh, and now he, he, he gets it. You know, this was non-scripted. He was just speaking um, from, from his experience and uh, what the legacy has been as well. 
in ways after the Jalof because he's been able to use that knowledge and go on and do many other things, um, have clients, make other projects in, in Earth as well. So it really, it really shifts the whole um, ecosystem. And uh, what we, we're trying to advocate for is, um, yeah, it's a, just a different relationship to, mm -hmm. to our building and to the world of construction mm -hmm. through, through Earth construction, but also the other biomaterials like TIFA which was also highlighted in the movie. It's an invasive species, but it's a great insulator. And, uh, and uh, we have an opportunity there again to showcase how we can build with just what we have and, and make architecture as well with it, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, it's, um, when you talk about the ecosystem of construction, we often forget that there's a financial um, I don't know if the word is exactly ecosystem, but there's certainly a financial substructure to it. And the cost of research and development into materials and so on is often something that we as architects never get to, to think about. I was speaking to somebody recently about the, the NEOM project, and you know, which has generated a lot of attention. And an engineer pointed out to me that projects like that in their slipstream have so much money that you can actually research and develop materials that otherwise would be completely impossible, that you need that, I guess, the constellation of capital to move thinking in different ways. And what's really interesting about this project is that it's, it's the opposite end of the spectrum, but by asking us to think about our relationship between our bodies and the earth, we're also pushing innovation in different ways. So it's, it's super interesting to me that we have these two scales, if you like, um, and that this is, at, at the level of impact, it, it's every bit as impactful in its local environment as something that's, that, that in, generates billions of dollars. Really, really interesting, yeah. Mm. Anybody wanna? Yeah, yeah, I actually, it's, and I think this is what is really interesting about what's going on in the continent um, where you're seeing this shift between the global north and the global south, um, where in the global north there is this talk about sustainability and all these buzzwords, but it's really to continue a condition that is unsustainable. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about these huge amounts of money going into these research projects, you know, to do these, create these amazing new cities or materials. It's really to continue a condition that is unsustainable. And what you're seeing and what this video emphasizes is the need to maybe look in the other direction where we're talking about, you know, the physicality of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not just our bodies, but these materials and that intersection um, with the earth. And I think that is a natural understanding of what true sustainability really is. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really that relationship between the human body, um, the material, and um, the environment in which, or the context in which these things exist. And I think when we're, the problem with architecture and so much of architecture and how it's taught is, it's so cerebral, it's really about what amazing idea could you come up with, and then how do we figure out that idea and figure out the materials to make it work, as opposed to the other side of it, which I think is actually the more humane and the way that you, know, you see a lot of power in the continent is understanding the conditions that exist and working with those conditions. Not, you know, we talk about the scarcity of resources or we talk about all these other issues, but that understanding of the land mm -hmm. um, is, for me, is, is so central to the direction that architecture should be should be moving. Mm -hmm. Aziza, you had the... Yeah. Like, like, first of all, I just want to uh, congratulate you both, uh, you know, like about this um, documentary, which I think is so essential because construction, I don't need to see how much CO2 is being, you know, expelled when you use, you know, like cement, cinder block, etc. This is an issue over the, the whole continent. And I think, Leslie, what you mentioned, that there are maybe two ways to approach it. One is, you know, like this young, you know, engineer who came in, who created his, his own company. And another way uh, is to actually come back to the idea of the hustle, of the uh, resourcefulness, and try to co-opt 
um, you know, like organization that exists, like for example, the uh, Hossein Lafarge, you know, who would uh, produce, you know, cement, right? But who has the means and who has the tools to maybe engage in, you know, R&D and help uh, produce, uh, mass produce those bricks, because that's the biggest issue. In Morocco, if you want to work, if you want to work on a hotel that has the budget, it's easy to do. But if you want to work on a government project or on social housing, the cost of making those bricks is still too high. The labor also, I mean, people, you know, like a uh, person doing the budget would do the comparison and say, why would I invest in, you know, a, a compressed, you know, earth brick. And it takes longer, it's more expensive, and even if you explain you, it's going to be more comfortable, etc. cetera, the, the stigma about being in an earth building, all those can be, you know, explained. But the cost, at the end of the day, it ends up being an issue of cost. And so, you know, if in Morocco, I'm just going to give you the example in Morocco where we went the, you know, other way, where, you know, we convinced um, Holsim uh, to... Uh, give us, you know, like a formula. They had like an R&D so that we can use um, remnants from, um, you know, like a, a, a weed now is legal in Morocco for pharmaceutical reasons. So the waste of marijuana is actually very good. It's like tifa, and that's just being discarded. So to mix it with a mix of earth brick and 5% cement to make, you know, compressed earth, this would have been impossible if we didn't use their, you know, R&D lab, which is usually for concrete. So it takes a lot of convincing. And to use a mold used for concrete cement blocks, the way that you find, you know, everywhere in Africa. So there is not construction of a new mold and a new process. So you use the exactly, the a mechanized system that's already there. So you co-opt a system to try to work you know, and, and get the mass produced, uh, you know, earth bricks that, you know, otherwise would have been too uh, costly. So I think what's interesting is that you could, there are many ways you can achieve having a lower cost, but I think we should not underestimate co-opting mm -hmm. industrial systems to new ends. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a way, this is going to lead, I think, quite nicely to the, to the film that we're about to show about um, the FA. But it strikes me that one really key component is required that we don't often speak about, which is to have confidence, to have confidence in an idea, to have confidence in the ability to persuade someone, to even have confidence in your right to be at the table. And so when BFA looks at the statistic of 1% and figures out an organizational structure to try and address that, it might be at a slower pace but one, I think, wishes and aims and longs for the moment or the day when there are not just two or three ways of tackling, that there are 30 or 40 that haven't yet been thought of because we don't have yet the agency to even think that we can think of it. So I'm going to play, um, if we can play the second film and then come back to some questions about BFA. Thank you. Fabulous, the lights are going back up. Um, there's a couple of things that I want to pull out um, of that film, which on the one hand is incredibly inspiring and uplifting, but I'm also acutely aware of the cost of being the people who constantly inspire and uplift others. And I think particularly after 2020, 2021, for me, it was the first time words like equity, diversity, social equity, inclusion became part of the kind of everyday vocabulary. And somehow, those who were possessed of equity and diversity were expected to teach those who didn't have it how to have it, what to do with it, how to negotiate it, etc. And a lot of that teaching and giving was couched in terms of it's good for society, but very rarely whether it's good for you. So having been in this space now for five years, can you say a little bit about the cost of providing, quote unquote, this service? Um, maybe I'll start. I think Firstly, we needed a space for each other, so it wasn't a cost thing or thinking about 
how hard it would be to actually do this because initially we were just meeting each other up. Um, but then understanding what position we're in and what responsibility we now have as you know, BFA was growing, that was a lot to challenge and also um, explaining that we have intersectional experiences. You know, a black woman isn't equal to a black woman and that, that sometimes that's a starting conversation with some of the people that we've engaged with and that's you know, quite a, a difficult place to start conversations when it's such a you know, moment where you're like, okay, I'm starting us from scratch here, having a conversation with someone. And I think we needed a few years to realize we don't need to do that. Actually, after 2020, we took a break. <laughs> you're like, we're not going to be the people that uh, explain basic things. And I think that was also a moment where we reevaluated re and we're like, okay, we're not going to do things for free anymore. It needs to fit in into our life. Because yes, doing evenings and weekends and things, as much as it was a passion project, is hard. You know, you um, you kind of invest, and it's all about your experiences. So there's a, a lot of emotions involved with this. We're sharing really deep things with each other that we hadn't shared before, and 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 a lot of things were to do with shame and guilt, and then realizing, oh no, these are shared experiences. Um, so the beginning was a lot of talking and then heaviness, but then it helped us articulate where we wanted to be and now we realize, okay, yes, we need to ask people for money, this is important. You know, we have, we have a bigger picture that we want to work towards. Yeah, 100%. I think there's something in, maybe also naivety creates a lot of opportunity to just kind of throw yourself into something without really realizing, um, yeah, not thinking about it too, too much. Um, and exploring that as much as possible. But then with the more experience, the sort of journey of life, you start to, it becomes extremely, um, yeah, necessary to question, okay, what, what is my value or where can I create value and how can it, how does that fit into my life? Because it's either, for instance, after 2021, deciding to kind of, tools down and reevaluate things and then different people navigating different phases of life does this organization then serve us if if it's something that i'm pouring my all into and it's yes serving me and providing me a community but not serving me in you know sustaining life for instance mm -hmm. as an income then how do i continue to do this great thing and create space and community for others, um, which I feel like is very important, but ultimately, if it's not sustaining us, then mm. how can I sustain somebody else? You can't be a life source to somebody else when... You can't sustain yourself. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting. I think South Africa has the highest number of female-led practices in architecture relative to the size of its architecture community. And when I went to work in South Africa, I was very struck by that, that there were these lots and, I mean, certainly more than in any other place I'd ever been, female-led practices. But the hidden um, reason for it is that childcare in South Africa is almost free. The cost of having a nanny in your house is negligible. So the residue of apartheid had made a labor situation possible that women could often delay uh, having children, number one, they had them when they were older, which allowed them to gain more seniority in professions, and then when they broke out on their own, they had the experience. But then also, if you had a child at 38 or 39 or 40, you often offloaded the care of that child because you could afford to. If you lived in Europe, you couldn't do it. And it, it strikes me that when you talk about race, gender, experience, life stages, this triple whammy, because you're all young, I think only one of you has a child, at a certain point you may want to start families, that's now an additional job, if you like, so you've got the job of the architect, the job of the mentor, the job, job of the organization, the job of the caretaker of society, and now taking care of your own families, it's quite a lot to negotiate. I mean, that's not really a question, but yeah. Yes, I mean, how are you finding it? <laughs> 
I think we, we are now in a space where we can take time off, whereas in the beginning it felt like maybe we can't do that, you know, we felt guilty. Um, but it's about finding your voice and being confident enough to say this is, this is what I want to do. So yeah, I think we moved into a space where that is now possible. Mm -hmm. I feel like something that's becoming very, very important is to understand that, okay, if you seek to create space because it's necessary, it's seek to advocate for change and be change, then there's space to question all of the status quo. Why should it be that the working day is the working day and the gender roles are the gender roles so you can't go and have your family and have a practice of some sort or spend time in Senegal exploring materiality and just building a life that is wholly more sustainable. Surely we could create a space and way of existing and working that is sustainable in all of those different sort of factions of life. Um, and yeah, I hope that we can use BFA as a platform to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you gonna say something? Yeah, I think almost linking this maybe slightly tenuously to your materiality film and how one kind of aspect that you're exploring starts to raise questions about a spectrum of things. And so BFA's existence and finding a means of existing that is like sustainable, like Selassie's saying, starts to question how do we work as architects? What does that mean? Like um, we were having a conversation the other day about black motherhood within architecture is really a space of resistance because it wasn't made for women to be able to go off and work. It wasn't made for us with this heritage. And so kind of, yeah, linking to everything we've already just said, finding these new ways of being that maybe don't um, resonate with the way the institution understands um, kind of organizations existing. But yeah, we're, our lives are kind of becoming intertwined into this exploration of um, new ways of being and practicing and um, supporting one another. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it strikes me that um, all of you in different ways are talking about rebuilding things literally from the ground up, which is a huge project and there are many ways to do it. There are many tactics, if you like. You know, sometimes it's resistance, sometimes it's co-opting, sometimes it's subversive. There are many ways to approach it. But I think what I didn't expect, particularly when, when we started this Biennale project, was that a, an inverted commas simple exhibition would upturn so many of the things that certainly I take for granted about the profession that I'm engaged in. And to see pieces of work and projects and discussions and conversations that are really about architecture on the one hand and about the built environment, but are actually about much, much bigger scale issues. And trying to find the language, whether it's film or advocacy or agency, whatever the language is, I find it really encouraging. I want to say to every critic who said this is not about architecture, that actually it is about architecture and architecture's relationship to everything else. And that's quite a burden. Yeah, it's, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm of the ex resistance approach. I'm, I'm very much about resistance, confrontation, activism, because I, I, I think it's like you said, you know, and what I learned when I got to Nigeria is that, you know, that it's, it's just a space where you say, oh, I want to do this, and someone will be like, eh, I don't care. And you're like, but I want to do this. And it, you're constantly forced to ask yourself, is this thing of value? Mm. Like, who is this thing for? Who does, you know, why are you here? What is this space that you want to take up? And if you're not willing to negotiate with me, I'm going to resist you. And I think, and it's interesting when you talk about this, Biennale, and I think what's so beautiful about it is the diversity, because that diversity comes from the questioning, mm -hmm. comes from people asking not just one question, it's like you solve one problem, and then you realize there's another question you need to answer, and that creates 
this diversity of approach, this diversity of work, this diversity of intersection mm -hmm. that I think is really powerful in thinking about the profession in new ways. And when you mention about, you know, when you think of what does it mean to be a black female architect, I think it's really important as you create the space and you think about the context you're creating the space in, it doesn't mean you need to conform to that context. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really important, that sort of resistance. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that. Um, I also wanted to touch on the importance of community, which is uh, what this Biennale, I think, has uh, really reinforced for, for all of us, is um, that in our diversity, we find commonality, and uh, it, it helps us so tremendously, because I think we've all um, somehow, um, as we're in this discipline, felt very alone. Um, at any given moment. It could have been when, uh, when we decided to study architecture because nobody in the family did it throughout the studies because of the lecturers. In practice as well, like being on the continent and uh, in a country that doesn't have that many architects, less than 300 um, in Senegal, um, and, and being a, a, a female practitioner also opens certain challenges, which is incredible the number of times I've had conversations with other practitioners, never met them, and it's like we've had parallel lives. Mm -hmm. They'll be based in Abidjan, in Maputo, in Addis, in Cairo, and, and it, it's, it's, it's always, it always strikes me how common our experiences are. And when we're able to, to be here, to be in this type of spaces, we have the ability, number one, I think, to be just genuinely comforted by uh, the fact that, yes, we're not alone in this, but also exchange mm -hmm. tactics advice as well, and that's uh, incredibly, incredibly invaluable. And I think in um, having organizations like the BFA and I really genuinely support you in the expansion, mm -hmm. <laughs> especially on the continent, uh, having community is very key. In our case, in uh, let's say the earth construction community in Senegal, we've realized that we, 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 we've sort of blocked out the noise and a lot of the adversity. People feel like it's very difficult for us to advocate for what is it that we do, but because we found each other, it's like we are so focused on doing our work and relying on each other to do it that we don't even know how it reads to the outside world. We don't even know that we're the minority, if that makes sense, which, which we are, like in the context of Senegal, it's negligible, what is it that we do? But because we're so immersed in it and so surrounded by people who share the same vision, um, and we put all our energies in really demonstrating how this can work, we, we just really don't have time to know whether people are embracing this technology or not, or what the doubts are, et cetera. So community is just very powerful in also giving you agency mm -hmm. as well. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And then I'm going to open in just to the audience in a minute, yeah. Um, so that in a way brings us uh, to the question of the Global South, uh, which for me was one of the questions that you uh, mentioned and asked us to um, think about. And I think the, the guest of the future, you know, like at least, uh, you know, like at least for me, uh, debunked in a way this term because I feel in the past I've always been representing the global south somehow and I felt okay I'm, I, I am you know in a way asked by some global north you know, for, you know for organization to represent this global south which is you know immense diverse you know like and so forth and this being Ali for the first time you know I felt that I was just representing myself not the global I was uh, representing my work and myself for an you know for audience even if we are here you know in the west but you give us this you know for opportunity to open up the biennale to most of the africans or the global south people that cannot be here mm -hmm. by using film for example by allowing our content to be on websites etc and i have to say that this for me is extremely important because this uh, biennale is not accessible to probably 99% of architects today in the Global South. Venice is too expensive, visa issues, etc. So I think that the community 
is extremely important. The best, my best time was before the opening, meeting all of the you know, other people, because it seems that people might know us. I mean, we are practicing in the periphery. Here comes again the term of core and periphery, global north and global south. And, um, you know, for the first time, I didn't feel at the periphery. Mm. And yet, I am in a privileged position. I am a professor in the West and so forth. But again, my personality is very, very layered. But my work is always considered as a periphery, as representing the global south. And for the first time, this uh, event and this biennale that you created, Leslie, and thank you so much, really, <laughs> uh, give us this opportunity to, mm -hmm. you know, advocate for, you know, our work. Thank you. So, <laughs> my, my thanks go to, to, to the participants. But it, it's so interesting. I think it was um, Neva who said that one of the struggles is to articulate. So in order to change something, you have to have both the language to, to describe what it is you want to change, but also the language to understand where you are. And it strikes me that so much of the language that describes, in inverted commas, where we are, is predicated already on a separation. Global North, Global South, Black, White, Diaspora, Center, Periphery, etc. So the very terms that we use to describe our position also inscribe the position. In, in that context, what is the inspiration, the kind of conceptual inspiration? Is it to go around something? Is it to go under something? Is it to go through something? And these questions for me are very spatial questions. They're strategically spatial. And who better understands space than architects? I think I read somewhere that a repressive regime will lock up its poets first because poets have the, the most difficult task, which is to condense everything into the least amount of words possible. Actually, it strikes me as really odd that the first people who are not locked up are architects because in a way ours is the complete opposite. It's using the maximum tools to describe the maximum situation. I don't think that's a question, but it's just, it's interesting to me. And just, you know, like a, 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 a small comment, I'm married to a historian, and when I had, you know, asked him, when we were discussing the term Global South, uh, I mean, he's a Marxist uh, historian, he uh, uh, reminded me that the term South, in a way, as a, as a concept, you know, emerged thanks to a, a, um, this essay by an Italian called Antonio Gramsci, it was called, you know, like the Southern Question, where it was talking about the difference between Northern Italy and then the Southern, you know, peasants. Um, so, like, I thought it was funny, you know, like to mention. And then it got, you know, expanded to the uh, colonized, you know, kind of countries. And then for me, I wanted to ask you back this question, Leslie, is how do you feel about this term? Because, I mean, for me, it's a metaphor. It's not just a metaphor for underdevelopment. It actually, it refers to patterns of colonialism, neocolonialism, and so forth. So should we, and I'm asking this question to, you know, all of us, because it is what defines our practices today. We said we are practicing in the Global South. We are a representative of approaches of architecture in the Global South. How do you feel about it? Shall we continue to use this term? Me, personally, I avoid the term wherever I can. It's... It's a kind of shortcut for things that people don't understand well. So the more we use the term, the more we normalize it so that it then just becomes another way of, of saying something. The best way I can describe this was when I first understood that Casablanca meant White House and the White House in the White House in the United States also meant something else. But because I hear those terms so frequently, I've ceased to think about them. And the Global South has become one of those terms for me. But at the same time, and it goes back, I think, to what someone was saying a little bit earlier, when you're trying to find the language that helps you describe the condition you're interested in or the condition you find yourself in, you yourself often need props and shortcuts and shorthand so that you're not constantly explaining yourself to everyone. So in some instances, the Global South is a useful synonym because someone else who I'm speaking to, and particularly funders, understand it. 
where I'm from in Ghana, if I use the term black or African or global south, everybody looks at me as if I'm mad. There's no similar rhetoric. So I think this issue of language is hugely important. And we're so used to describing ourselves as the developing world, the Arab world, the black world, the third world, as if all of those worlds are somehow separate from everybody else. Yeah. I mean, one of the texts I go back to time and time again is The House of Hunger by Dambuzo uh, Melcher. And, and what I love about what, you know, I mean, his life was his life. But what I love about what he was trying to do with language and why, you know, he chose to write in English as opposed to, you know, at, I think at the time there was a lot of um, writers deciding to write in their own lo local languages is to sort of stretch the capacity of the, the English, of the language. And I think that is sort of important as a form of resistance is to also say we're taking some of these terms and some of these ideas and we're going to stretch them. Yeah. You know, and we're stretching them um, in order to understand our conditions better, but also as a way for you to take reference, mm -hmm. you know, in the malleability of, of, of some of these ideas. Um, and, and for me, that is really, really profound. Um, and, you know, one of the scenes that I read, oh, I think I have it inscribed everywhere, is, you know, when he comes in and I think in a scene he's just passed an English exam, etc., and he goes into his house and he starts speaking to his mom, um, and, and she, just, she just slaps him, you know, because she's like, oh, because you're speaking English and you're educated, you think you're better than me. And, and just, just gestures like that that reinforce um, this idea that language is something that needs to be uh, stretched and, and played with and not always assumed. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, even, um, just to pivot, even to go back to this definition of what is an architect, right? Especially in our context, it's, uh, I think we're still in the process of trying to, yeah, find, uh, find language to define that, what that is. Um, and um, it's uh, quite exciting to see that many people are are just doing that exercise themselves because a number of, of, of uh, really brilliant minds that I've, that I've met and I guess working on this Biennale has reconciled that, that will shun away from calling themselves an architect. It's almost a bad word. It's almost, um, they don't have the, either the recognition because the ARB is watching everywhere and it's omnipresent so we cannot call ourselves <laughs> architects if we're not registered. Um, I think just does so much disservice to the discipline, I'm not going to say the profession, to the discipline and what is it that we can do in society. It's like there's so many skills that we, 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 we have because of our training, but there's so much that we learn as well from practice, from our communities, from our context, so much that we can respond to. And, uh, and it, it would just be good to, for each and every one of us to continue, and the upcoming generation as well of architects, to really um, define what that means for themselves, you know, in a way that is, you know, that is uh, informed by their own identities, the ways in which they position themselves in their context. But uh, it's a very wide and all-encompassing discipline, and I just feel that we really do it a disservice by kind of trying to shrink it to one very sort of rigid and, and defined term. So, yeah. Just to piggyback off that, I, I, I have a strong feeling that's why Demas was awarded the golden line for that particular reason, because he seems to encompass, encompass this idea of, um, because obviously in Nigeria he wasn't recognized as, as an architect, even though he was so much more, so it'd be interesting to hear I mean, for, for sure it was about his practice, but it was also about the fact that many of us are doing a multidisciplinary or practicing in a multidisciplinary way as if we invented it. And actually, no. People like Damas were doing this 50, 60 years ago, so the fact that he wasn't recognized locally, I think is because he, he was a Cassandra. He was so ahead of his time that you know, they wanted to cut his tongue out. So for me, it was somehow about writing, uh, not necessarily a wrong, but a, something that had been overlooked. So it was both his practice and him, yeah. 
Yeah, just, just to add, I think this conversation around practice is really important because I remember that made a big shift in my education when I was asked what my practice is and that gives you responsibility to you know, be someone, think about what impact you want to have and I do that now with my students and they get very confused, the second and third year students and they want to be told what mm -hmm. the practice is and it's mm -hmm. like, no, it's you, you experience your life and that will make a whole difference to how, how they go out in the world um, mm -hmm. thinking about and defining and naming what their practice might be. Mm. Um, and I think, yeah, just touching on that point of defining for yourself who you are and what it is you do and these kind of phrases that we use, global um, south, global north. Um, like as a diasporan, I was born and raised in London, but I would consider myself a Ghanaian, which means that somehow I'm inhabiting both of these spaces at once. And so then I think those terms then become redundant in when we're trying to define who and what we are. Um, so yeah, I guess um, back to Papa's point about um, not conforming to your context. Yes, whilst these phrases are um, useful in some contexts, I think um, we shouldn't lean on them too much in defining who we are and what it is that we do. Mm -hmm. But, but I think there is also um, um, a desire. I, I don't want to use the word responsibility because I think too many people carry too many responsibilities. But there is a desire to somehow also make the work and the practice and the knowledge that comes out of this experience of layered identities available to everyone so that it's not only something that you can appreciate, understand, experience if you yourself have had that experience. But actually that work is out there in the world in a way that it's an option to be understood, maybe even enjoyed by, by all. So there's a funny desire in a sense to, to, to put a boundary around these experiences in order to let them mature and to, to give them space and time to nurture and develop but there's also the desire to break out of that boundary at a certain point where it's not exclusive information or knowledge it's shared and when is the right time to break away from that i think these are all temporal questions if you like that are, are really Im important and, and difficult but at the same time so much of black culture just gets exploited mm -hmm. once we give mm -hmm. you know what i mean once we give the template I mean, you think about popular culture now, you think of even the, the history of black bodies and, mm -hmm. and, and what we've done. Um, and the part of me thinks that there needs to be a moment in time where that knowledge is shared amongst ourselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the continent and with the diaspora in a very deliberate way where the intentions of what we're doing is very focused on the people that we wanted to impact. Yep. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. So I think in, in, a, in a sense, that's what I mean about the protection of the space in which these explorations occur. And it's kind of ironic um, in a way that maybe in the last, I don't know, five, ten years, the one space that's been seemingly the most instrumental in discussing these issues was not a school of architecture, was not an architectural professional event, it was an exhibition. So there's something about the open-endedness of an exhibition that has made it possible to talk about this where the university, which I would, my instinct would be to say that's the place where we do this, is often the last place that this happens in. So there's something also flawed in our models of pedagogy, which I think every single one of us here has experienced whether as a student, as a professor, as a part-timer. I'm very conscious that we've got about five or six minutes left, so if there's any questions from the audience, do let me, or do let us address them. And I've got plenty to say, so don't worry if, <laughs> if not. Any questions you guys would like to raise? Sharif, you've been very quiet. <laughs> okay. No, I had um, 
I mean, earlier, but I think um, Amma started touching on that. I wanted to maybe ask um, the members of the BFA a little bit more about how you see your condition um, as, um, and, and I know you've deliberately used the term black, but we're going to expand it as, you know, interchange it also with like African, maybe for, for now. Uh, how do you um, see that identity in relation to also what is happening on the continent? Has there been um, efforts or particular things that you want to link with, like not just the people, are there certain sort of dynamics or just, yeah, overall, I, I wanted to, to see in your own personal um, cases, how do you, yeah, see yourself in relation to the, um, to the continent? I guess I will start this off and let the ladies um, carry on, but um, you touched upon like how we, def we chose black and not African. And I think as there needs to be an acknowledgement that as a diasporan, we are kind of like, if there's a Venn diagram, we are kind of in this middle area. So I have never lived in Africa. And so geographically, I, it would be a bit cheeky to call myself an African. Um, but at the same time, I think it's quite clear that um, definitions of like a quintessential British heritage also exclude me. And so I can neither call myself African or British, but I think blackness is somewhere I comfortably inhabit. And so having that as a label, I think, is, is a broad enough umbrella term that all the like, different inflections of that are kind of covered which makes it an exclusive, inclusive enough space for kind of all the spectrum of blackness and Africanness and mixed heritage and yeah. Um, and I guess speaking to what's happening on the continent, I'll let Stasio on that one maybe speak to. I think we touched upon that a little bit uh, before, but we have, um, we have ambitions to work globally, collaborate and you know, we know there are members everywhere in African countries and we just haven't been able to, you know, work or meet or make things happen to, for members to meet over there. So I think if we could, you know, pro project ourselves in the future, we would want that to happen and that would be very exciting because we've seen that happen in smaller scales. When members meet each other, they, they get inspired, sometimes they work together, sometimes they do projects and, you know, we would be just made a social thing happen and that that was the result. Um, so we know that this magic can happen and we'd love for that to be happening everywhere, yeah. And I think you're in a very good uh, position to actually, you know, kind of create this link in order to, you know, of, of amplify certain voices of uh, practices or of, you know, art or so forth, any discipline that's related to architecture to, you know, amplify them back into, you know, uh, Europe, for example. Uh, and vice versa, that your own, let's say, um, struggles or, you know, concern, which are very different to what maybe, or sometimes similar to what people are experiencing on the continent. And I think now with Zoom, um, I mean, you know, like I've seen examples where students that have attended such, you know, kind of conversation would go back to Africa to do an internship or to work on a research project. So, so I think I would really, you know, like encourage you if I can help in, you know, any way, I would really love to. And please also, like I had mentioned to you, uh, us North African are also African, so also do you know, integrate us, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and one last thing is uh, that I really would like to you know, advocate for in this panel uh, is, I mean, I'm hoping, and I think, Leslie, this is the seed you know, like that you planted, is to encourage more uh, support um, you know, like among ourselves and, and also um, collaborations and um, one very simple you know, example is you know uh, if somebody an architect today in Morocco wants to work with earth they're gonna go to Crater in France for expertise but what can they go to Elementaire in Senegal for example so I think that the white man um, syndrome that a lot of our you know institutions have really has to stop and it can stop with us being you know advocate for each other we all have amazing you know you know expertise and I think we need to support each other. And I think in terms of, uh, I completely agree, even as you were talking about the Crater example, I'm gonna jump back on the earth construction bit is, uh, and to just echo um, some of the things that were said about language, is that I also am very convinced that 
in the continent and the diaspora, we have a lot of internal languages that we don't know that we share until we actually, you know, create situations. We were just saying that an architect is a makeup situation. So we create these things to happen. There was um, a Nigerian um, um, architect that trained at Crater. Um, she's an expert now for a lot of international institutions. And uh, recently for a project in Nigeria, she was telling me that she organized a workshop in the north, I think in, um, yeah, in the northern Nigeria of a renovation of an earthen um, um, monument. And they brought masons from uh, Burkina Faso with all the masons from um, the Edo state. In Burkina Faso, people speak French mostly, and I mean all the local languages, and they didn't actually have a language to communicate until they started working together, because well, the language that they all mastered was that of earth construction, especially in the traditional techniques. So the workshop just happened, and throughout time, you could see that from mason to mason, it was that language that could be shared. We also have plenty of languages that cross borders in Africa as well, which is uh, another thing that we can lean on as well. Um, and, uh, and, and I think ultimately as well, many of the certain lived experience, even in the diversity, because obviously as for me particularly, I was mostly brought up on the African continent, and I think I too had the experience, even though I had staunch Pan-Africanist parents, that once you go to the diaspora, once you go to the States, when you, so I lived in Haiti, you really become African, right? Like people ask you, oh, are you African? And you want to get offended, but you do understand what that means when, 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 when you're there. and. Um, and finding ways as well to understand what that experience was like as well for the people that left the continent and you know crossed over and the condition that is developed there, um, as different as it is, it's always very, I think, eye-opening and um, and very um, um, what's the term? Also very edifying to understand the multiplicity of the black experience, you know, um, in this world, and that ultimately as well, I still think that there is a responsibility for, especially people on the African continent, to continue to also lay the ground for a lot more of these collaborations to happen, um, because despite all of the political setup in which we are, I think we'll have a lot more, like I say, common language than, than we realize. Yeah. Um, I, have a um, I have a question for the architect, being the only one that is not an architect here. Um, as a filmmaker, at the beginning of my career, I was very afraid of being put in the box of, I'm an African filmmaker, right? Whereas I do realize that it is very much part of your identity as architects to say that you are African architects. Why do you think that is so important? I mean, I don't necessarily think that, like, kind of like what Emma was saying, I don't necessarily feel like I would describe myself if somebody asked as an African architect. Maybe because I'm diasporan. Um, but yeah, it's, it's again back to this thing of multiplicity, back to this thing of a layeredness, uh, back to this thing of, I think you'd, the analogy of a chest of drawers that you pull from, I think comes back into it. In some instances, yes, maybe that is a good for like a, a good descriptor of who I am, but in other instances, maybe not. Um, in my everyday work, definitely it's, it's not. Um, when I'm fully with my BFA hat on, it, yeah, then it becomes definitely more about blackness um, being African and how that plays into it. We've had really interesting discussions around what is blackness if you are an African living in Africa versus what is blackness if you are a diaspora living in Europe, for instance. And it's very different and it's, you know, not, it's, it, it, it's a thing of, like you say, language and translation and, you know, two sides of the same coin and all of these sorts of analogies come into play. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I didn't really answer your question. But I think it's, no, but <laughs> it, it, it's also that, um, as a discipline, learning architecture, if you are not from a Western canon, that's not your history. I think the discipline makes it very clear that you are an interloper. So I remember as a first year student reading Bannister Fletcher, I mean, I've said this so many times, I sound like a broken record, but 
Bannister Fletcher's Tree of Architecture was the quintessential text 30, 35 years ago. And the first page is a drawing of a tree and it has a number of branches. And there's everything from the Abyssinian temple to the Incas to the Aztecs and it goes up through the ages and eventually you get to the Renaissance and so on. And I remember looking at it just thinking, where's Africa? And it wasn't there. And in my second year, we were given a text by Hugh Trevor Roper, the British, very famous historian. And I remember sitting reading the words, perhaps someday in the future, there will be a history of Africa. At present, there is none. Only the uninteresting gyrations of barbarians in a distant part of the world. Now, 30 years ago, that was a text that we were all given. So I think the first impulse was to say, let me claim something here, which is why I think the conversation around race and identity, Africa and blackness is so important to architecture because as a discipline, possibly unlike film, its very basis was exclusion. Some people have architecture and some people don't. So I don't think we're anywhere close to being able to say that, yes, we have it, but we are further than we were 30 years ago in the West. On the continent, it's a whole different discussion. We've had architecture for two, three, 4,000 years. So it's, it's but, partly that. But it's also the fact that we are the tree. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, the wood. And, and that, for me, is like, so when someone says to me, oh, what does it mean to be an African architect? My question is, what do you understand the word African to mean? Mm. And I think these are, you know, and I think these are the complexities that people don't want to engage in. And you need to say, look, I'm not here to serve you. So I'm just going to do my thing. You figure out how you're going to engage with me. And me, I'll just continue mm. because I'm the tree. Like my ancestors are the tree. They exist in the tree. Everything comes from the tree. So everything comes from me. And, you know, Zynga talked about hustle. And, mm -hmm. and I really believe that that is one of our great strengths. Like, there is something inherent in the African DNA that um, is so powerful and strong, both spiritually, but also in in resilience and resistance, mm -hmm. and everything will always come back to us. You know, the circle of life comes back to the tree. It comes back to the continent. So when, I, you know, when we talk about upcycling, when we talk about sustainability, when we talk about um, adaptive reuse, I'm like... We've been doing it. But you know what I mean? We talk about practitioners that are sort of expanding behind architecture. I'm like... Okay, so are you seeing me now? Because I've always been here. And it's, I think maybe because I'm not in the diasporan space, I, I, I struggle with some of the conversations that mm -hmm. ask for dialogue. Um, and I'm kind of just like, oh, okay, so when you're ready, come and meet me. <laughs> That's it. Uh, when you're ready, come and meet me. And, we can talk, but mm. the, t the terminology and, and this idea that I need to explain myself or that you haven't documented uh, my, my ancestry or my impact, um, it's, it's, I'm not saying it's fine, it is what it is, um, but don't undermine the truth, you know, because you think but, but the, the, the counterpart to that, though, I would say is you look at the syllabus or the syllabi of most schools of architecture on the continent, we are teaching things that Europe stopped teaching 50 years ago. So... But we've talked about how the problem is partly the institutions mm. and hustlers don't enter institutions. Hustlers are on the streets, you know? Like, they're getting stuff done. They're figuring things out. We saw that in the video. They are... They are actively engaged in the earth, in the practice. And I think as important as institutions are, 
um, what institutions represent is also extremely political. Mm -hmm. You know, ins institutions have an agenda, and anybody that doesn't understand the institutions exist as part of a wider structure, right? To reinforce power, to undermine certain people's agency. Um, but we can um, subvert them. I think that's, you yeah. know, like our role. This is, I mean, for me also, I always see the expanded role of, of the architect. I mean, to change, to try to influence, to change the, the curriculum, but to be able to influence, to change the curriculum. I mean, obviously, there is a political agenda, but that needs to be, you know, you know argued for why we need a larger understanding of our own heritage in Morocco, for example, our sub-Saharan heritage, our Berber heritage, etc. But I think most importantly, we have to be able to change the curriculum and include certain aspects of that curriculum. We need to preserve and document and archive that heritage that very often we don't know, especially the one that's uh, post-colonial, you know, even the colonial one. And, and very often it's being researched and its stories are being told by the West, not by us, mm -hmm. right? So speaking about filmmaking, about you know, also our you know, expanded role, sometimes I wish we could, we could clone ourselves, right? But there is a very, very extensive work that we need to do on documenting our 20th century heritage, even our you know, older heritage, uh, before, because it's, our cities are changing so fast and we're losing so much of it. And I think you know, if only we can do it, we could you know, advocate for it. And therefore that can come to feed this change in um, curriculum, hopefully. Okay, well, I'm going to say thank you to the panelists. It's gone on longer than I thought, but it's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you to the audience for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. And I, I, I end almost everything with the statement, watch this space. But somebody's put their hand up to ask there something. There is a question. Yeah. Hello. Okay, I'm sorry I wanted to ask you from before, but you're already ending it. <laughs> um, uh, I am. Uh, my name is Lea. I'm myself an architect uh, from France, uh, actually from the Reunion Island, which is a very multicultural place. And I've been living in Kenya and Tanzania for some years, and I, I practice a bit there. Uh, I mean, quite a lot now. <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you very much today. It was very, very beautiful to hear you and to see you all here and to have this quality of, uh, of discussion here. Thank you very much. Um, I just had a question, uh, maybe very different from what you have just talked now, but um, it's just this question of time and about uh, scale of uh, about the growth we talk and. Uh, kind of huge number we always talk when we mention Africa and so many of the countries, and which is kind of, of scary, I think, in our practice when we talk about uh, affordable housing and this huge number from politicians. And is uh, I see it like very a bit scary to, to enter, and I just want to ask you yourself, because you act yourself uh, very strongly, and I'm sure you're gonna have each of you a huge impact behind, but it's just about this, uh, how do you see yourself in this uh, huge scale uh, challenges in front of you in your practice? Thank you. Um, I think that looking at the scale of the challenge, I agree, can be intimidating. And so me personally, I focus on what it is I have in front of me. Um, because for me, that's the only sustainable way of working. I will be scared away <laughs> of carrying on if, if I allow myself to kind of be overwhelmed by the scale of the work because it's huge. The, the work started before us and it will probably continue after we've gone. And so for me as an individual, it's like, okay, the work that I'm doing in BFA, um, by um, extension is, and because we, predominantly diasporans is linked to the work that's happening in Africa. And so no matter how maybe small or insignificant it may feel in the moment, I think just focus on what you've got in your hands at the minute. And kind of when you look up, you'll realize that actually we've made a lot more progress than um, we realize. We're ready to take it on.
We can tackle it. I mean, I think there is like a new generation, I, I feel, of decision maker, you know, also coming to the power. I mean, they're the client, they're the governments that um, have also new visions, have been, um, have uh, concerns about sustainability and so forth. I mean, I see a lot of, I mean, despite political instability, economic instability and so forth, I think there's also a new generation of thinkers, of architects, uh, who wants to take you know, of agency. And I think you never make big changes at once. I mean, I believe in smaller changes. And uh, if you take a lot of smaller changes, then when they come together, even if you change even the way that somebody starts to think about materials or even start about building typologies, even if you convince one person that that person, if it's a developer or if it's a politician, can have like a huge impact. So I think, yeah, we are ready. I think that... Um kind of connected to this idea of um, sustainability and us being the tree and just other things that have been discussed around on, on the stage today. I think we're in a, a space and time unlike ever before. Africa, I I've had loads of conversations around this, is needing to go through its own version of industrialization but that needs to happen in a way that it didn't, in a different way than it's happened in the West because everybody is acutely aware and are suffering the effects of climate change and you know, the, 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 the language of sustainability is becoming more and more prevalent. I feel like that creates space for us to explore what a new type of industrialization looks like. And when we start to answer that question, I feel like because of things like the internet, because of people needing to be, to re recenter themselves morally, whether it's in how we engage with each other, whether that's, whether that's with how we engage with our environment, with material, and I really like the way you spoke about having your, your, your own body needing to be sort of part of the process of engaging with material matter all of those sorts of things and this sort of move away from, say, somebody who's a philosopher whose job it is to think and theorize about all of these things, being drawn closer to sort of everydayness, I feel like all of those things merged into one gives us the tools to be able to address these big issues um, a lot better, but by doing it in the sort of one step at a time, one move at a time, knowing that your impact impacts, say, BFA, three of us founded it, four of us founded it, three of us are co-directors of it, there's 450 plus women in it, each and every one of them, if they have a Im positive impact on even just 10 people, there's a ripple effect. Yeah. If I just may speak to something as well, is that uh, to me to be on the, the continent and practicing as an architect there is also to be in a context where there's a huge sense of urgency. And you'll be surprised, like you arrive, you're a bit young, you're thinking, okay, let me just you know, start maybe with a house and just you know, get a bit of experience. And the next thing people are asking you to do things that you never dreamt you'd be doing. And sometimes the brief is to, um, I don't know, recently, for instance, in our practice, we are now thinking about not designing forests, but actually making design to preserve forests. When, when did we learn this in architecture school? But it's become, I mean, it's part of a global train, um, a train project that goes through the forest and there's an opportunity there. I mean, there's already sort of a risk that has been presented, but an opportunity because there's funds around that project to actually do something. And uh, this makes us, think about the project in very, very different ways where we have to engage different actors, botanists, like, you know, different ministries, um, um, sociologists, anthropologists, like people that are thinking, are bird specialists, etc. cetera. Um, and, and you get into a whole other realm of design and we constantly are bombarded with this type of request that if you, I think it will cure your imposter syndrome as well because you can easily just think, okay, you know, I'm not the person that is adequate to respond to this, but in a way it's kind of like, if not us, then who? It's important to know what 
we can do and when we also need to bring other people in. Uh, I think this is a responsible thing to do, but I, I've really realized that being on the continent is just this, this too much urgency and you, if you don't respond, somebody else will do it and will pre probably do a, a, a worse job, you know, they will find, I don't know, a Chinese or Turkish a contractor that wants a contract and they'll have their in-design team and they'll do whatever proposal with no criticality whatsoever and it's going to happen. So there's no time to waste. There's a lot of um, things to respond to and uh, you just have to learn to really just jump on the opportunity and, 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 and move forward in the most responsible way possible. But, but, but there's, no, there's no option to just be at all. And, and just chill. At least that's what my experience has been. Um, just one thing to add. Um, in my context, for instance, by 2035, I think 75% of Nigerians are going to be under 30, and we have a massive housing deficit. And one thing that I find really interesting when we have conversations about development is that nobody understands, everyone talks about Africa and Nigeria in a very difficult way, all corruption, this, this, but they don't respect the fact that we're probably the only continent that is going to grow ethically. You know what I mean? When I mean that we don't have the opportunities to go somewhere else, extract their resources, and come and build our space. So it's really fascinating when the world thinks about you know, this kind of idea of this world that is equitable and ethical, nobody understands it. Africa is going to be the first mm -hmm. continent to actually sort of exemplify, you know, the desires of the human condition. You know, all these theories, all these philosophies that have been sort of touted throughout time, um, they've, always, they've always been undermined because they've come through the lens of exploitation. Mm -hmm. And we are where we are with the limitations and our challenges, and we have something that has never been had any time in the world before with this, this youthful population. Um, and I think, how do we engage them to participate in a very physical sense, um, and at the same time in the sense where there's equity? So whether that equity is in new structures of the relationship between how houses are acquired or how houses are built, you know, these are real opportunities to sort of create new frameworks um, that can really solve a lot of the problems and also create um, new ideologies that can move mm -hmm. at a later date globally? I think it's, an, it's a brilliant question and also probably a really interesting point to end on, but we are the world's youngest continent, but we have the world's oldest leadership. Mm -hmm. the, the gap between our demographic and our leadership is sometimes as much as three generations. So in that void between leadership and youth, there is an incredible opportunity, I think, for the ambition, and dare I say it, the naivety of youth to overcome these questions of scale. Because one of the brilliant things about being a teacher, and it's one of the reasons why I will never give up the classroom, is that when you are around people who are two or three generations younger than you, you are first-hand at the coal face of ambition because that ambition hasn't yet been dulled or dented or even, dare I say it, corrupted. It, it, you know, the older you get, and I can say this from experience, the harder it is, in a sense, to, to hang on to the ambitions of youth because life kind of gets in the way. And the older you are, the more of a struggle it is to, to retain that. So on a continent like ours, where the, the predominant agent is full of that youthfulness, I think exactly as Papa says, there's a, an enormous opportunity to do things differently, and that extends from the way in which you build, the materials you use, the networks you form, the relationships you have, the idea of community X, Y, Z. I think the last barrier for many of us is how to enter the political arena because the political arena is often the last barrier to that optimism. So, in, in some ways it seems logical to me that more Africans would study architecture than any other continent, 
because it affords you the ability to think at scale, even if you don't go out and become a practicing architect. So it's amazing to me that per capita we have the least number of architects. So in the world's fastest urbanizing continent, the world's youngest continent, we have the fewest architects and the fewest schools of architecture. Question from the lady in the back. Hi there. Um, thank you so much um, to all of the panelists. It's been a really nourishing talk, and thank you, Leslie, for making this space. Um, my name's Glenda. I come from London. I'm also a, a BFA member. Um, I think in your discussions, you all touched on, in some capacity, of the unexpectedness of where you're at in your careers, or at least what you've realised so far, whether that is, you know, the realisation of negotiation and how important that is, or the realisation of the different ways conversation has been directed through the recent years or even exploring new materialities. And my question would be, what are some of the things that you're now looking forward to or imagining or expecting for the future years to come in the practice? Retirement. <laughs> Should we end on this? Maybe yeah. you go around. Yeah. Um, yeah, getting rid of all those old people in power. That's, that's really what I'm looking for. Are you looking for. at me? No, 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 no. <laughs> no. I, I mean, Le you know, Leslie made such a huge point about this disparity between uh, the policymakers and, and, and this burgeoning youth population. And I think there is obviously that, you, you know that cliff is, is getting closer and closer before that generation drops off. So I'm really, really optimistic, um, and that's what I'm really looking forward to. And, and I think it will be quite messy, but I, I think there will be a lot of um, agency that sort of comes from this transition. Um, I think one of the things that hit me unexpectedly was how much, um, how crippling imposter syndrome can be despite the kind of objective value of the things that you have to say. Like, age is not an indicator of, um, like, the validity of your ideas. And it took me some time to realize that, but I'm now coming into a space where it's like, no, my experience is valid. The things I have to say, my particular um, perspective on the world. Um, and now realize that, realizing that I'm excited for the fruition of all the ideas I have, which were previously held back by um, a lack of confidence that kind of found its root in um, being questioned by people who have less of an understanding of the context I'm speaking to and allowing that to define how I value my own ideas. But once you kind of get out of that, it's like, oh wait, damn, like this is, it's about to be lit. <laughs> it's about to be really good. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to. I think the change has, you know, at least in Morocco, those old generation people, because maybe they eat too much uh, greasy food, have already started to die off. So the change has already, yes, goodbye, uh, has already started. But I still think that it's not, we should not rely only on politicians and decision makers. I think that our role, especially in Africa, has to expand. And, and I guess if you look, I mean, had the chance to meet one architect in Morocco, from uh, who was actually who created the Order of Architects, you know, of Elia Zaguri. Uh, I met him when he was 92, and then he told me that, uh, you know, his role, I mean, he, he came out of age in the 50s, and he told me we were before all, you know, architect for the masses. We had to be citizens before we were, you know, architects. Uh, and they had to, you know, advocate. Their role was to, you know, educate their um, clients. I mean, obviously, they were more listened to and valued at the time. But I really see our goal, and this is not something that, that we taught in school. In school, we're taught we're a service, you know, of industry. You know, you, you, the client will give you the brief, and then you would perform, and so that he would hire you again. But, I mean, I think in Africa, the state of, you know, of urgency make it even more. I mean, this is, you know, everywhere, even here in, you know, Italy. I believe our role needs to be you know, advocates for the better good for, for everyone, for human beings, for the environment, for um, fauna and flora. And even if the generation of politicians is changing or is gonna change, depending on which country you are in Africa, uh, this is where our role really 
uh, will start. And we need to take that role. And I know in Morocco, even some architects have already went uh, into politics already to make those changes happen. I think I will add to that because um, I feel like the freedom to um, always be fr um, redefining my practice. I'm looking forward to that because unexpected things can happen because it doesn't need to be one thing. It can be multidisciplinary. You know, it can be, you can take the experiences of your life and you needed some time to be confident enough to now know that this is a power, you know, this is something I can design with. So ever-changing practice is something I'm looking forward to, collaborating with new people, uh, new ideas. Yeah, I think I'll definitely agree. I, I think that space to redefine what an architect is, is I feel almost that there's more opportunity to do that on the African continent than there is to do in the West. I feel like in the West, we're almost too far set in our ways and too defined and restricted by institutions and other tropes. Whereas, correct me if I'm wrong, my fellow um, <laughs> returnees, um, but I feel like there is, because of the urgency, because of all of the work that's yet to be done, there's far more space to do all of the things that we've been talking around here, which is to do with redefining who an architect is, what they do, where the spheres of influence are and how they connect with every other sort of field to for that sort of goal of ensuring that we're moving in a sustainable um, direction. Um, it has come up so much about how that intersects with politics and yeah, it, it's all so layered, but I feel like that's what I'm looking forward to the most, being in these spaces, having these inspirational conversations and then meeting the incredible people that would create opportunity to do something with that. I think it's, yeah, super exciting times ahead. I was just gonna say a very quick one. I think what I'm looking forward to the most is really um, the expansion of the realm of possibilities um, on the continent. And I think it starts with uh, expanding our minds, um, knowing that we can and deserve to live um, in environments that are taught by us, um, that are taught for us, and uh, that really encapsulate everything that we are, everything from how we, how we, you know, what is our comfort limit, like even in sustainability, you think like bodies are different, right? Like you design for comfort, but you have to really center how you feel. It's about, you know, knowing what is it that we eat? Is it produced locally? Can we develop and rely on so many of our crafts, of our arts, of our economies? Like, I think it's, um, it, it's a very simple dream, but it's really, it's really to, what I want for Africans is just to know that it, it is possible. We don't have to import models, we don't have to import materials, we don't have to import ways of thinking. We have absolutely everything at our disposal. And one thing that we just need to, and I really believe as simple as it is, it really starts with the mind of just being able to expand that realm of possibilities um, and, uh, and then everything will follow suit from that. What, as an outsider, what I would expect from those that are practice architecture will to, would be to be even louder. Spaces like this are very important, right? But we need to, to keep in mind that you are doing this for the mass, so it has to be more inclusive. And the reality of things is the mass all, often feels excluded from events like this, for example, right? Whereas I find that you guys are really on the, on the right path, but we have to, you guys have to utilize every tool at your disposal, whether it's film, whether it's photography, whether it's exhi exhibitions, to keep doing what you are already doing, but even louder. But, uh, yeah, I mean, just to kind of end this on, I think, a really, two really positive notes. Um, one is that actually, fundamentally, what we're talking about all the time, I think, is to do with confidence, to, to build confidence, to nurture it, to, to temper it sometimes, to mature it. And, and the other is to say that, I think maybe for the first time in 30 years of teaching, I feel 
incredibly optimistic about the next 30 years. I don't think I could have said that 10 years ago or even 15 years ago. In some way, I feel like the future is in very, very good hands. So, yeah. Rebel, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.